right. So let's make sure I get the right freaking slideshow. There it is. That's the right slideshow. Hey, look, nothing's covered up by our cameras. That's pretty awesome. Um, there we go. Head coach, man, Matt rule, seven total years as a head coach, just over 500 record Baylor. He was 19 and 20 and three seasons, 28 and 23 at temple, uh, four bowl games, three wins, one loss, won 10 games or more three times, but also won less than seven games three times. So it's kind of one of those guys that has those mediocre or mediocre meteoric rises and then takes off to the next job. And then of course we knew what happened at Carolina, which wasn't great. Uh, but there you go. Finished two seasons ranked in the top 25, including one in the top 15. I know you guys talked about rule on kind of, I believe it was your last show where you kind of rated the hire and took a look at some of the assistants he had hired up to that point. And I thought the consensus at that point on in that show was that the two of the three of you were pretty cool with the Matt rule hire, right? I guess I think uh, me and Derek were a lot higher on him than what Tyler was. I, I mean, I think he is one of the best hires. I mean, if you look at this last cycle of coaches hired, I mean, I put him right near the top of the list of best guys that could have been hired. So um, I think if you look at the history of Nebraska, I mean, we have not made a lot of splash hires. This is a splash hire. So, yes, there are certain things I don't love about him. I lived in Charlotte for a while. But that that is part of it. Just bluntly, if you were a fan of the NFL team and you grabbed their worst coach ever, then you probably would have a little bit of a backlog. But I know college is different, and I could put I can do that. So I don't know. But yeah, yeah, that's fair, Justin. I'm probably the coolest on this hire. <laughs> Still like it. Still like it. You're on mute, Ken. My bad. I'm still getting used to this new board. Uh, I'm kind of the same way. I, I wouldn't say I'm cool on the hire. I was pre- I was a little warmer on it when he was first hired than I am now because I do agree with you guys in a lot of ways about the coaches. It seems to be on the surface a lackluster set of guys that he's brought in, but they're his guys, and I guess at some point we've got to trust that he knows what he's doing. As far as the process is concerned, Derek, did you want to say anything specific about rule or, or you Scott, or do we just want to go ahead and move on to the fun part, the assistants? <laughs> well, I could always, uh, I'm not going to go off or go on a tirade about rule. Cause we'd already kind of had at least a brief discussion about it in our last episode. Um, but I will definitely make sure to tie him in to these assistant coaches that we're going to discuss because I think they all kind of have a little bit of a trend. So that's all I'll say. Yep. They definitely do. Uh, You are correct about that. So let's move to coach number one, which we'll, we'll start with all the offensive guys and then we'll move on to the defensive. So that way we can get the, the fun discussion of one particular coach out of the way fairly early. (laughs) Uh, So First off, we've got, whoops, I hit the wrong slide throw. There we go. Marcus Satterf- Satterfield. Boy, I'm still going to have a hard time with that name. Uh, Temple, as a rule assistant, he was there co- coaching offensive coordinator and QBs 2013-2014 and then offensive coordinator running backs 2015. Baylor, tight end coach from 2018 through 2019 and a Carolina assistant offensive line coach in 2020. And then he spent a couple years at Tennessee Chattanooga as a head coach. Um, his last job, of course, was South Carolina. As you told me, Justin, on a phone call when we talked a little bit earlier this this last week, that uh, a lot of the folks in South Carolina are pretty happy to see Marcus go. What is it that you're, you've heard specific from those fans as to why? Is there a particular part of his offense that people don't like? Is there a reason they're just glad he's gone, even though they did do as well as they did those last two games? So we have, uh, you know, me and the cousins, we have lots of cousins, actually. So, I mean, if we were to do a podcast with all of our cousins, there'd be like, I don't know, 40 or, or, 40 or more. But uh, we have two cousins that graduated from South Carolina, and uh, they're big cocks. Big freaking cocks, right? And uh, <laughs> huge. Anyway, uh, they <laughs> are not... I don't know. I, I don't think that they uh, thought this... Uh, they weren't excited that he was cut because they're also Nebraska fans also, but uh, they weren't excited about him going to Nebraska and they were kind of happy 
one of them was kind of happy that he was there. One of them was a little bit curious to see what he could do uh, next year based off of the, his final two games at South Carolina. But that whole stretch when he was at South Carolina did not give them any reason to be happy about uh, him remaining there in South Carolina. Tyler, you, you talked to Ryan and Sean quite a bit. Is that the impression you get to? Yeah, I, I mean, I, w- I would say that they were they were definitely not – crushed that we took him um and you know they from a game clock perspective and they they definitely weren't doing backflips that we got him i i think they were very much like a lukewarm position and and i i was trying to think of a good like equivalent uh for nebraska and, and honestly i can't think of anyone on the current staff that would probably have like fallen in that bucket like you know, maybe Mark Whipple a little bit, but I think by the time Whipple left, people were, were pretty happy that he wasn't being brought back. I it just, so I can't really find a parallel, but I think they were just kind of lukewarm on him leaving and lukewarm on him coming to Nebraska. And yeah, I mean, we, we definitely did not steal South Carolina soul with this hire. Like <laughs> exactly. That, yeah. It wasn't a steal. <laughs> and, and here's why. Ken, you want to talk about the last two games? Man, even with those last two games, their their total offense only ranked seventy yeah. fifth in the country. Yeah, went much better than ours, right? And, and if you take we those two like games away, they were ninety sixth for seventy nine. Yeah, so yep, I got you. they were they were forty fifth in scoring offense, so middle of the road. You take those two games away, they dropped down to sixty fifth. Like those two games really improved what that offense really looked like throughout the year. I got you, Scott. You got any thoughts? I mean, I know we kind of talked about him before, but. Yeah, I mean, it is very underwhelming. Uh, it's a very underwhelming hire. I mean, yeah, he's seventy fifth. He's seventy fifth in the in the country, and then uh, what is it? Ninth in the SEC, and from the previous year, previous year he was one hundred and tenth as an offensive coordinator, and almost dead last, just right behind Vanderbilt. And so, technically, there was an improvement, but I mean he had some pretty good talent to work with at South Carolina. And the fact that he wasn't able to put together a consistent game plan, game in game out. It just, I don't know if it was, he couldn't get his guys to just stay locked in. Cause I mean, yeah, the last two games were impressive, but I mean, you got to show that game in game out. I think that those were just individual performances more than it was 500 IQ offensive uh, coordinating. So Definitely an underwhelming hire. Um, you, but can I just throw in there? I, I, I understand maybe not a wow, but like, but when you are taking a standing coordinator from an SEC school, like this isn't a guy who just got fired. He, he would have been brought back. I mean, all the signs pointed. I just, I, I just think that the, the bar is, I don't know. It, it was, it's, it's not a bad get. I mean, to take a standing guy. And again, he was part of what he was part of a uh, Baylor, which is what you can't say about everyone on the staff. And he was part of Temple. So he has been a ride or die with rules. So I don't well, know. Let's, let's hope he doesn't bring that rushing offense with him. Cause I got, <laughs> I got some bad news for you. Guess who he tied with in uh rushing offense this year. Nebraska. Us, Nebraska. <laughs> Dead even for 99th yeah. in the country. The, you know, like, uh, Marcus Satterfield, I think you uh, summed it up pretty well there, Scott. You know, it is underwhelming for what uh, we thought we were going to get. The only thing that could make this really bad for me and leave a sour taste is if he were to bring Spencer Rattler with him from South Carolina to Nebraska. (laughs) I would absolutely despise that move. uh, The the only thing that would make it better is if he showed up and his teammates – like strapped him to a chair and like dyed his eyebrows like brown or something like that. Um, you know what? I'm actually here. To bring him with bring Brattler. I'm all for if are you for Rattler for real? I'll, I think I think he's a good quarterback. I just think he's toxic for the locker room. Yeah. I don't think he's a leader. That that would be the only like yeah, he's a baller. Like dude, Tyler's an army of one talented. right there with uh being on the Spencer Rattler bandwagon there. That's that's crazy. Well, have we? Well, I mean, uh, Spencer Rattler is the only reason Marcus Satterfield <laughs> offense looked any but good this year. Oh yeah, because that's a I mean, common. That's that. like the common denominator between last year and this year was he got 
well, a good quarterback. Who, who, who would you rather have, Casey Thompson working in Satterfield's offense or bringing Rattler to, to Nebraska? Casey Thompson. Uh, what you have at wide receiver, really. I don't know. The offensive line didn't apparently like Casey Thompson too well either. No, they didn't. They certainly didn't. Apparently, they didn't like the steak he took him out for when he first got to town. <laughs> they probably <laughs> what, ordered take him to well Applebee's. Done. No, <laughs> he ordered he ordered them all well done, which is what inspired yeah. them to start jerky. Because they were like, if yeah, we're gonna get well done steaks, well we're done. at least gonna make yeah. a jerky company out of this. <laughs> oh Lord, that's funny. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, I don't remember what the name of the place was he took them to, but it was a steak buffet of some sort. It was they, Applebee's. They did all they could to I'm just uh, kidding. To, Golden uh, Corral. The run them out. One. Yeah, Golden Hey, that would they, I've had took Golden there and, Corral, and it was not kind to me. So if he took them there, that'd have been bad. I love anyway, uh, <laughs> the, ne- <laughs> the next hire we'll talk about uh, is running backs coach EJ Barthel. This is to me. This is a guy that's kind of in my my top as far as a guy that I see as potential. Um, simply because I know everybody wants to take a look at UConn. And say, well, look at the competition they had to play and all that stuff. How did he? But anytime you take any kind of an offense or any kind of a rushing game from bottom of their conference or bottom of the independents and take it up into the top two or three teams amongst the independents, I think you're doing something pretty good. So if you look, <clears throat> I just looked up just a few, a few um, stats. UConn's 2021 rushing yardage was 1,195 yards. 3.16 yards per carry, 18 touchdowns, 99.6 yards per game. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? Uh, and then in 2022, when he got there, it was 2,339 yards, 4.8 per carry, 18 TDs yet again, but doubled up on the yards per game to 194.92. So uh, ranked sev- second out of seventh in- seven independents and ended up with the 32nd ranked. Rushing offense in the NCAA. So for me, this is kind of with that that guy that I'm kind of eyeballing to see where this rushing offense goes with him and how well one of the other guys on that was retained on this offensive staff, uh, how they work together to get that running game hopefully off the ground or on the ground, I guess, if you will. <laughs> but um, uh, just whoever wants to start who's got some thoughts on EJ Barthel, uh, throw them out there. I'll, I'll say this. When, when, I, when we first hired this guy, I was I was very underwhelmed. I was like, who the hell is this guy? I looked numbers. I wasn't overly impressed. But, but I will say this. I'm hearing a lot of good stories out of my recruiting trail already. He's growing on me pretty fast. Well, what, what also is interesting is, uh, you know, you saw the tweets. Jim Mora sent out a glowing recommendation for him. Uh, in a tweet, you know, I mean, so that, that was pretty cool. Uh, I, I don't know how, how uh, often a head coach or how common it is for a head coach to speak that glowingly of a coach that's leaving the program. It just seemed like uh, I don't see it very often. And when Jim Mora did that for EJ Barthel, I just thought that was like, wow, okay, maybe there is something here. So uh, yeah, he, I think I think he's got definitely potential. I don't I don't hate the hire at all. I think he's got I think he's like I think everybody would agree. He's got potential. He's got potential, but he doesn't really have necessarily a, an eye popping resume other than just the fact that the fact that he was able to do what he did at UConn in one year is like, okay. I see you. I see what you're doing. Um, but if I were to just compare him to, let's just say Brian Applewhite and just what kind of track record he's got, he doesn't have one. And so it's basically a gamble. It's a roll of the dice. Maybe he's got a really good philosophy. I mean, I'd assume that's what he's got. I assume he's got a really good philosophy. He connects with the players. And like you said, Heard some good things on Reddit and seen a few things on Twitter about his recruiting ability. And we'll see how it all plays out. But once again, it just kind of follows the trend of just being like, eh, I kind of have to, I have to try to find something. Like I have to try hard to find something to like about him. And it just makes me kind of go, meh. 
So if you want to find something to like about him, I mean, he he was at UConn, right? UConn has been a bottom dweller for a long, long, long time. And UConn had a really good year this year. I'm not saying it's all because of EJ Barthel there, but Jim Mora, he did outstanding things with him. And I think EJ Barthel with the, with the hand that he was dealt there with all the injuries, he excelled. He completely excelled in that running backs room. So you could actually see something in just – that one year at UConn that he made huge progress in a doormat of a program. So he coached those dudes up. So I, I will give that to him. If you I, I got that I, UConn. I mean, you can go, you can go places, especially with good talent. Well, I got a question for you guys. I, I don't have an answer for it. So uh, did UConn switch offensive line coaches too? Or is this an offensive line coach that's been around for a while? I mean, I, I, oh, I, I guess where I'm getting at is, does, does the offensive line get some credit for what his running backs were doing? Or is it all on this coach that made him start running better? It was all EJ. EJ did all it EJ. all. Uh, I think he helped run the ball. I think he went in there a couple snaps. Uh, <laughs> went, went, in, went in and blocked for his running backs. <laughs> yeah, I, I, dude, I'll tell you, what, we, we, you're getting, I mean, you want to talk about, he's, he, he's a definitely a vibrant, uh, active coach. Um I think it's going to bring a lot of great energy to this position. Um, I, I, Scott, I, I think your point on Apple White is an interesting one. Um, I, I think you could say that about a couple coaches we brought in where it's just, you know, we were a four and eight team last year. And when you're like, man, the guy they're replacing, I think's a better coach. It, it, that seems kind of a weird tactic to take um, to, to do that. And, and, and because of EJ's resume, that does kind of seem to be the point here. Yeah, that would be that would basically be the point that I I don't necessarily blame Brian Applewhite for the lackluster productivity we had in the running backs room. I mean, he had his high, hands tied behind his back with a god awful offensive line and a a offensive coordinator who has the creativity of a black and white painting. Um, so it's kind of one of those things that I just kind of look at and I go, I think we did Brian Applewhite a disservice um, this year and, and really made him look bad. Um, Cause yeah, I mean, he had, he had talent, he had talent. It just wasn't able to, it wasn't able to come together through any form of rhythm. Um, so looking at EJ, uh, EJ, uh, Oh shoot. EJ Barthel. I want to say like Bethard for whatever reason. I got freaking <laughs> Iowa quarterback name stuck in my head. They live rent free, clearly. Um yeah, when I when I think about him, it's like he's got good potential. Um uh, I just hope that this Marcus Satterfield guy can give him room to breathe. And uh Donnie. Well, hopefully we give talk him about him here back. soon, we'll but run. Yeah. Yeah. Give him, give him an offensive line that can, oh. that can make something happen. And I think you do pose a good question there, Derek. Like what, I what I didn't even answer. look into the offensive line. Like what was he really working with? So, it was also I don't know. Jim Mora's first year at UConn. So he brought EJ Barthel in with him when J- Jim Mora took the job this year. So my guess is they also have a new offensive line coach. I didn't look too deeply. But Mora came in this year was his first year as head coach at UConn and obviously Barthel's first time there as well. So a lot mm-hmm. of things changed then going into that. So uh, let's see here. <laughs> I'm looking at 16 oh, different windows. I will say, I will say that EJ Barthel's got a really good looking beard. That's, that's a yeah. definite 100%. Uh, I can get down with that beard. That's a good beard. <laughs> yep. <laughs> It's got to be a I, great I coach can't, then. I can't, I can't grow a beard, so I, I get automatically <laughs> give Coach some swagger if he's got Hey, you got a killer stash game going on, Scott. Don't yeah, sell yourself you. short. short. It That's just doesn't great. grow in anywhere else. So <laughs> I could grow a goatee, but goatees are like apparently like not the thing to do at this point. There's in the, world. the answer as to where Casey Thompson took everybody when he came from the office. That's a good spot. Yeah. yeah. That's a good spot. Definitely yeah, it wasn't the food use. there. It nope. Was... <laughs> That's an interesting question. Uh, Go Big Redcast is also asking, get your opinion, guys, with Pete's not coming now, which we wouldn't talk about anyway, but we might as well before we move on to uh, offensive line. 
uh, would we like to see Satterfield coach the QBs instead of OC and tight ends and then hire another O-line coach who also handles tight ends? What do you guys think? I, I'll go first on that. I, so that, that's an interesting dynamic of a tight end and another offensive line coach. Uh, that isn't the move I would like. I'd kind of like to see Ed Foley, uh, maybe him taking over tight end coach. He did that in the past. Um, he is He did that in uh, – Temple and maybe making a stab at bringing in another defensive coach. Um, hmm. You know, there, there's Pete's probably was going to make a good chunk of coin. Um, so there's a bigger names on the market from defense. Um, you know, we can re bring up the Robinson debacle, which we haven't been able to pull him the 15 times his name has been brought up from AM. Yeah. But I don't know. <laughs> That's what I'd like to see is to maybe make a stab at a bigger yeah. name assistant. Well, I know, I know Foley's got in, uh, got experience in offensive line as well. So tight ends, offensive, I think he had like 17 years of offensive line experience or something to that effect overall over his career. So, uh, he's experienced there as well. Um, so that's why you call, that's why we call him Ed F and Foley. Ed F and freaking <laughs> Uncle Foley. Ed. Absolutely. Uncle well, Eddie. Well. Uh, hey, shitter's fool. Uh, dang, now I've got to, now I've got to throw the explicit tag in on myself. Sorry. <laughs> You're the first Next one. Slide. We've got the hot button issue in Husker Nation right now. And I've heard many takes, even amongst the media, who the media always tended to be pretty friendly toward uh, Husker head coaches, especially one that we will not name, uh, who shall remain nameless. Um, so, okay, Tyler, I know you've got something to say. So just let her rip, dude. I don't. I don't hate it. Um, and, and again, I think. I think. Well, well, can you give me a look? Like, am I in an alternate it? universe? No, no. Ju- wait, wait till Justin gets up. Oh, okay. You'll, gotcha. you'll, he he's the one that. <laughs> he, I think that Donnie fits very much the mold of coaches that uh, rules brought on staff. I mean, if you look at the guys <laughs> he brought in, he's brought a lot of former NFL guys that were that, and that kind of fits his mold. Um, he. Last year was not a great year, but I don't think anyone expected it to be a great year. He was really dealt a shit hand. Did he do anything to really build on it? I don't know. Um, I think it was important to keep a carryover coach. And while I could have probably named better names, I mean, I think we need to find a guy to do it. So uh, of all the hires, he's kind of a middle of the road guy for me, um, honestly. And so I I guess that's kind of my bar. Hey, I'll, we'll, I'll, we'll, I'll say this. Go ahead, Dustin. So, jeez. To, to me, the guy's impressed two two head coaches at Nebraska enough to get hired. So he's doing. He's got to be doing something right. I do believe he was just handed a complete shit platter last year. You know, with uh, New Ely, his expected starting guard gets suspended for the year. Nebraska gets hurt three or four games into the season. You lose him for the year. Uh, it was just an impossible situation for the guy. I, was the offensive line bad? Yes, it was. It was terrible. There's no doubt. There's no denying that. Uh, I, I don't know that any offensive line coach is going to come in here and fix that situation in one year. So I, I'm willing to get, give the guy a shot. I, I I will say me and Tyler had some pretty good laughs. We've been telling Justin for two or three weeks before he was even a candidate that this was going to be our offensive line coach. Just, just to screw with him. <laughs> and he ends up actually being our offensive line coach. And while I would have went out and found, I don't know, about a dozen other guys I would have taken <laughs> yeah. before him, I'm willing to give the guy a shot because I don't think I, I don't think you can judge him off of the <clears throat> one year he's had in Nebraska because I think it was an impossible situation for about any coach. Mm-hmm. Okay. Is it my turn? Anybody can red, go, buddy. whoever wants to go next. Seven seven million dollars is what Matt Rule was given for an assistant uh, uh, pool, right? Mm-hmm. So everybody had in their mind what they thought this the assistant coaches what that was going to look like, right? Everybody had the visions of who that was going to be. Donovan Rayola was not in anybody's forecast of coming to see what was going to be on the staff in the following year. And th- after the initial set of hires and there, they weren't any wow hires for assistant coaches at all. Right. 
But there were two coaches that you really cannot miss on in the Big Ten, and that's offensive line and defensive coordinator. Those are two coaches you cannot miss. And with a $7 million pool, we went out and got a $300,000 guy that really did not show anything. You can talk about the hand that he was given. Okay, yeah, it was a shitty hand, but you know what? He probably shouldn't have been in the job anyway. There should have been more experience in this position anyway. He's getting another shot. I, we have to love it because he's going <laughs> to be our guy. I love it. It's just, it is. Well, it just, is. well, we have to love it now. I mean, Justin, we before, have to be behind him, right? Before Scott gets no, I can, in here. I, guess I can my, pretty much hate it. I can pretty much hate it. I'll, I'll but, just, but my, I guess, he, it. but okay. I understand the, the concern, but my question is, is there really, from the rumors that have been out there about who he was interviewing, if it wasn't Rayola, it was going to be someone that had the exact same resume as Rayola. Like we were not going after season offensive line coaches. That's not yeah. So so that's a problem too, right? Like because... that wasn't that wasn't who we were. We were not looking at a Big Ten offense. We weren't looking at Bart Scott or whatever his name is from Illinois trying to steal like a Big Ten. Pop. That wasn't it. We were looking at NFL assistants. Yeah, and, and you know John Garrison, he just left North Carolina State to go to. Uh, Work with Lane Sean Kiffin. Callahan reported he didn't get an interview. He didn't yeah. get a call. So, I mean, it's, it wasn't like we were puzzling. going after these guys. It, it, it's it's truly puzzling. And, you know, you talked about the carryover. If you wanted to bring one coach from uh, the 2021 staff, there are so many other guys that have shown their ability to coach and recruit. I mean, Barrett Root, he's another young, energetic guy who's really coached that uh, those linebackers up hard and gotten those young guys to play hard, like Ernest Hausman, who's now gone. <laughs> and, uh, yep. you know, there's just so many other things. And we have, we settled for Donovan Rayola. And what really pisses me off a little bit is everybody talks about, you know, all the other people, Tyler, you're talking about, you know, like Ed Foley helping on offensive line and all of these guys with offensive line experience. You have all these babysitters to to babysit them when you have seven million dollars. You could get one other guy to do it because you know what? There's a lot of inexperienced guys. Yes, you're you're right. Go big red cast says uh Osborne always said he thought having two offensive line coaches on staff. That's great. But what I'm getting at is like all the inexperienced coaches that we have on the staff, nobody's talking about babysitting them and providing them extra help to you know to help out in the secondary or the linebackers because we're going to be talking about those guys and they're even experienced but they're saying it for Donovan Rayola. You only say that because I mean your argument is like well he needs the help. I mean it, it's just it's really silly. It's really silly. And maybe maybe Donovan Rayola is going to be a great coach but it, on the surface with a seven million dollar budget. Can, can, can I ask that. a question? Since we've gone away from the two offensive line coach system, how great have our offensive lines actually been since Osborne retired? You could argue they well, once especially once Solich got at hand, uh, it just hasn't been the same. When we've had one guy in there running the offensive line, it just hasn't been the same. Granted, we were running the option, the offense was completely different, but uh I could see some definite benefit in having a main guy that's in the room that the kids look to for technique and whatnot like that, but also having another guy in there for for cleaning up the things that the new guy is trying to figure out. But I get it, though. With the, yeah. the pool of money that Rule had to work with, uh, quite frankly, my surprise in all of this is the fact that he was given $7 million, number one. Why? Because he's Matt freaking rule. He doesn't go hire rock star coaches. Never has. He's hired his guys and his guys are usually people. Nobody's ever heard of. He's a, as he said, a developmental coach. He runs a developmental program and I don't think he just develops players. I think he, he takes a lot of pride in developing coaches too. So that's the way I look at it. He's hoping to develop Donovan. And uh, my feeling is the way rule is he's the East coast guy. You don't figure your stuff out in one year. We've got another guy we can probably plug in next year because you're out the door. So we'll see. So, so the under, you know, the uh, underdeveloped coaches that he's brought on. Okay, so you get it at Temple, right? They probably don't have a huge salary pool at all. So he's mm-hmm. going to make do with what he does at the Group of Five level because I'm sure that's what 
a lot of those do. programs. He won too. ten games two years in a row. I think he knew, he knows what he's doing and he knows what he's looking for in a coach. But, I don't. Think but he's even at Baylor, Baylor all. coming off of what they had come off of, I can't imagine that the investment in football and the athletic department was going to be too high. So, you know, I, I don't know what that pool was, but he made do with uh, what he did. You know, we're getting three high school coaches in there, you know, but a lot of that was probably could have been political because you have to, you know, you have to kind of change the view of that program to get other uh, coaches to uh, send their kids to Baylor after coming off of, you know, all that bullshit there. But you, you make that argument, Justin, but I guarantee you Baylor fans were sitting back going, we're giving this guy a $3 million pool and he's going after high school coaches. Are you serious? Maybe, but it's not seven million, you know. But, but it's the same argument. I mean, it's the argument here that I'm trying to make is simple, and that's the fact that Matt Rule is not going to go hire the latest rock star in college football just because he's got seven million dollars to do. He, what if he doesn't get along with the guy? What if, what if it doesn't work with his philosophy? His philosophy is completely different from most people. He wants to develop first. And that's, and that's a mistake, they, and that's a mistake. All of us Nebraska fans have made ranked yet, and then suddenly they get ranked as soon as Matt Rule gets on them. So, you know, and that's, I don't, and that, that's the that's the mistake all of us Nebraska fans have made over the last I don't know three or four hires. Every time we get these new hires in, we're going, "Oh, they're, they're going to get these really, this really great coaching staff." And you know, <laughs> I I don't remember Bo Pelini. I don't I don't remember the hires he made. I don't I don't remember what he did that made us all feel warm and fuzzy, but. You know, Mike Riley came in. He brought all of his buddies with him, with the exception of a few guys. And then Scott Frost came and he brought all of his buddies. There was no exceptions. And now you got Matt Rule and he's doing the same thing. Like this is what coaches do. They, they bring, bring in guys, guys that they know. know and they trust and that know what they want to do. I think, that, but he doesn't know Donovan Rayola. Well, and I think the difference too is, I think I would have been fine if he would have brought his buddies from Baylor. Um, you know, that that would have been fine for me, but that's not the staff that he brought in. Most of the nope. staff didn't coach with him at Baylor, and Rayola is an example. And and back to the the um the two offensive line coach, I I'm not saying it obviously worked for Tom and that, that was a great idea. I man, I just think with all the different things right now, like one of our offensive line coaches was a special teams too. They helped out with that. Like, so I guess you could throw Ed Foley there, but I think Ed Foley has his hands full. And again, maybe he could take over tight end coach. I just, I don't know. I, for someone who played a much, much, much lower offensive line, I can't imagine having two voices in that room. I, I don't That's, know. It seems tough for me. When, to when really one of them said Foley's voice, you're ready to run through a wall. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Probably a brick one, too. Not know that you got hurt. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, have we, well, no, we haven't because. Scott, you really haven't talked about Raiola yet. I know you're pissed about it. You don't like it at all. Um, so why don't you go ahead? I mean, you're probably not going to say anything much different than the rest of them have, but you need to be heard. So be heard, my son. Yeah. I mean, if there would have been anybody that would have been carried over from the previous uh, staff, Donovan Raiola definitely would have been on my bingo card. That's for sure. Um yeah, it's kind of a surprise. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe Matt Rule does have a history of developing coaches and giving them a lot of room for development. I guess to be a little bit redundant. Um, but this just uh, this just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, I I understand the context. You know, I can be a glass half full guy and say, well, you know, he was dealt a shit hand. We've said that. He, uh, you know, he's, he's a new guy. He's this, he's that, he's all these things. But what it ultimately comes down to is like, dude, it's, it's the big 10. You've got to have a good offensive line. You've got to figure out your trenches and maybe for whatever reason, Matt rule saw something in this guy that he just absolutely fell in love with, which I assume is what happened because I don't see any other reason why he would have retained him aside from 12 dudes all walking out of his door going, I don't want anything to do with this program because it's such a dumpster fire right now. And then he just settled with Donovan Raiola. Um, 
you you have that, to you have to laugh a little bit at the irony of this, though, right? Like we've all said this. Like oh, Carmen yeah. Royal is the absolute last guy that's going to get hired, and he is the only one that gets retained. Yeah, it's an absolute. It's it's well, you, like, can't, you have you to can't laugh at that sketch. irony. If you can't have a sense of humor about that. I don't. I don't oh know yeah. What to tell you. I, I do. I, I actually kind of laughed when I first saw the headline. I was like, <laughs> what? Okay. I, I have All to right. Admit, we'll I see. I, I giggled too. I, I was like, oh, wow, this, this absolutely figures. And then I, and then the other thought that occurred to me was this is like such a total Matt rule thing to do. This is the Nebraska you know, way. It's just, it's just, it's what he does and we'll see how it works out. I will say, let's see how I big did, of a wall we can build up before we try to tear it down. Yeah, <laughs> it was, um, I did just a little bit. I did, looked at some some stats between the offensive line in 2021 and the offensive line in 2022. Uh, there was zero improvement. In fact, the lane, line got worse when it came to passing and rushing offense. End of story. There's you can't sugarcoat that. But one of the things offensive line, um, offensive play calling has something to do with that. Offensive play calling, yeah, we could say the X's and O's certainly had something to do with it, no doubt about it. Because Whipple, Whipple's, having running, a, Whipple's running attack was garbage, and and running and running a offense that the backup quarterbacks had almost no snaps in practice, and then when the main guy goes down, you basically have no offense. Didn't help either. Um, but what did change under Donovan Riola is the fact that there was, and one of the things Rule has mentioned is he wants to run a disciplined, physical football program. And you can say that the the discipline definitely improved on the offensive line because in 2021, they had two, 24 offensive line penalties throughout the season, average of two a game. That dropped to 14, a 41.7% improvement in 2022. So the offensive line wasn't hurting this team with stupid penalties at the wrong moments. In fact, in 2022, there were five games without an offensive line penalty. So... Um, but then you look at market the improvement, teams, definitely an improvement. But when we played the best teams like uh, Oklahoma, uh, Michigan and teams like that, those were the games where we had multiple penalties on the offensive line. Cause they had multiple creatures on the other side of the line that tended to make our offensive line look dumb. Uh, so there's, you know, there's trade-offs all the way along, but what you can say is that 10 less penalties over the course of a season is going to make a difference in uh, your line not hurting your team uh, in the win-loss column for oh, certain. they found a way. Pick up.